thanks for the invite, Randy, and to everyone at Central Region. Pleasure to talk to you today about uh, snow squall warnings. So the outline will give a brief motivation for why we're issuing snow squall warnings. We'll look at the Ready, Set, Go forecast approach. We'll briefly touch on the warning criteria and then uh, go through some operational best practices. Obviously, in 15 minutes, there's only so much we can touch on. So I would refer you also to the WDTD YouTube channel where we recorded a couple of training modules that run about an hour and a half and give you a lot more detail on these topics as well. So unfortunately, as Andy just mentioned, there's a long history of deadly accidents with snow squalls. This led uh, in the last couple of years to the development of the snow squall warning, which really fills a critical gap or void that existed in the National Weather Service warning suite, specifically the short fuse cold season winter weather warning. I think we're all familiar with web or newspaper headlines such as these where we get accidents and pileups on interstate highways, especially where the rate of speed of traffic is high. And uh, you can see oftentimes with these events, very little snowfall, but high impacts and uh, injuries and fatalities. So mitigating this is really the primary motivation for the creation of the snow squall warning. This is an event looking back in Loganton, uh, Pennsylvania in December of 2001. Uh, there are non-meteorological factors involved uh, in the Pennsylvania State Turnpike, for example, there's a lot of tractor trailer traffic and the road design isn't necessarily conducive to uh, the amount of traffic and the rates of speed that we see, especially when the weather turns bad. So in this particular event, uh, 100 vehicles were involved in a pileup resulting in eight fatalities and uh, 45 injuries. A few years later, there was another event that from a meteorological point of view was well anticipated. There was an Arctic front with uh, snow showers and squalls that was anticipated more than two days in advance. The morning radar depicted the Arctic front and the line of snow squalls, as you can see there on the right. The prefrontal temperatures were generally in the upper 30s and then postfrontal, the temperatures rapidly dropped into the mid to upper teens. And unfortunately, despite the good meteorological assessment of what was going on. There were, uh, once again, three separate multi-vehicle accidents, including uh, six fatalities and 17 injuries. So it was clear many years ago that the notification and the warnings needed to improve in various ways. And it's taken a while, but fortunately, I think we're there now in a much better place than we were. This led two winters ago to an operational demonstration that took place the first snow squall warning was issued by the Binghamton, New York office on Groundhog Day of 2018. Uh, you can see the radar imagery there uh, of this first event. It was actually kind of a hybrid event that evolved off of Lake Ontario and moved across South Central New York. And the demonstration involved six WFOs, there were four in Eastern region, and then the White Lake and Cheyenne office in uh, your region were also involved. And the reason for the operational demo was to test the dissemination, make sure that the polygon went out okay to the web pages, that it went okay to the private ve vendors such as WSI and the other vendors used by the TV meteorologists, just make sure everything was in line. And then we also were able to uh, get some good state partnerships going. You can see on the lower right, um, the variable message boards. Uh, we had New York State on board with showing a snow squall alert notification on the message boards um, in and near the uh, polygons. So that's something that the local WFOs in central region can inquire about. Um, obviously, it's up to the DOTs how they want to display that information or if they want to display it, but uh, certainly you can inquire and see what their plans are as far as that goes. Dovetailing with the operational demonstration, national headquarters did a survey and had over 60 respondents answering questions such as the quality of the product, the ease of interpretation of the product, and the appropriateness of the National Weather Service to issue snow squall warnings. And you can see there on a scale of one to 10 and just the basic yes or no answer is everything came back uh, pretty positive. In addition, there were a number of quotations that were received from a broad cross section of users, all of which were very much appreciative of having this um, additional warning product. So we felt uh, this gave us the confidence a couple of years ago to proceed to the point where it became a fully spun up uh, operational warning. And now for you guys uh, this winter. 
Another thing we're trying to do is apply research that's been done in the last uh, 10 years ago by a number of, of folks, both within and outside of the National Weather Service, leading to best practices. Uh, we're building knowledge and applying that in operations. Uh, so that on the ops floor, we're making sound and consistent uh, warning decisions when it comes to snow squalls. Now, I do want to mention the snow squall warning is just one piece of the jigsaw puzzle here. We're sort of in the preseason now. This is when you can meet with your state and local partners and assist, assess their needs and mitigation strategies for all types of winter weather. And you can also be creating awareness slides for social media. You get to the one to three days in advance of an event. Uh, this is where you'll get your meteorological identification, oftentimes through the high resolution NWP, possible snow squall events. You can start your mentioning in your AFD and your hazardous weather outlook, and also any kind of heads up email that you may do, uh, or heads up communication rather through NWS chat, email briefings, and so forth. In the one to 24 hour uh, time frame, the mesoscale details will tend to become more clear especially in terms of timing and location. You can continue those briefings to state and local partners. Uh, here in Burlington, we issue a long-fused SPS up to 12 hours in advance, maybe to highlight potential we have later in the day for snow squall development and also increase social media messaging. This is important because uh, from a strategic standpoint, if there's any kind of pretreatment of roads that's going to be done, they really need longer than that time frame of the snow squall warning to get that done. So. Some of these earlier time frames are also uh, critically important to the, to the whole process, much like it is for warm season convection, where we also apply a ready, set, go sort of philosophy to that. In the zero to one hour time frame, now your snow squalls are on radar. You'll be getting into warn gen, as Andy mentioned in the previous talk, issuing your snow squall warnings or, in marginal cases, uh, short fused SPSs. And you can have additional communication, of course, through um, other means. So the directives mention specifically that snow squall warnings should be issued when there's radar or satellite indication or reliable reports, say webcams, uh, meeting or exceeding the fact that you have visibility of a quarter mile or less. Uh, really stressing again the sub-freezing ambient road temperatures or plunging temperatures along and behind a cold front sufficient to produce flash freezes. It's really the icy road conditions that result that uh, produce a lot of the high-end impacts that we see. And then gusty winds and blowing snow also being um, a component of this as well. Now, there will be some forecaster judgment uh, concerning time of day, day of week, and other societal factors. You know, all else being equal, if it's a marginal looking meteorological setup and it's two o'clock in the morning and the traffic volumes are light, uh, in that case, you might lean more towards an SPS as opposed to what you might do in the middle of the day. So there are some factors there that I think are uh, need to be considered. There's definitely some non-meteorological and societal things going on um, in an impact-based warning uh, such as this. So I think we're all familiar with these situations, a uh, video here from the Iowa Department of Transportation where you get a few minor fender benders on the interstate and the uh, traffic stops and then everyone's flying along at 70 miles an hour, probably going faster than they should be for conditions to begin with. And this creates, um, you know, accidents and fatalities. And uh, good Samaritans sometimes are killed trying to help out as additional cars pile on. So a very dangerous situation. I think we're all sort of familiar, um, unfortunately, with those things that can happen. So. The flash freeze, again, is an important component of this. Uh, on the left, we see snow squalls along an Arctic front, say, that maybe initially the snow's falling onto pavement that is above freezing. Uh, that snow will melt on contact, and you get diabetic uh, cooling effects, in addition to strong cold advection as the front comes through. And you very quickly, any standing water becomes um, ice. And at that point, you get very treacherous travel conditions. Now. Obviously, road chemicals will mitigate the flash freeze potential on treated roadways, but sitting behind an AWIPS workstation, you're not necessarily going to know what, what roads have been treated and so forth. So the flash freeze is definitely something to keep in mind. And if you have pavement temperature information for your CWA, you definitely want to be integrating that into part of your situational awareness. So again, a key takeaway here is that flash freezes can occur with both uh, uh, Arctic post-frontal temperature plunges 
and the frictional warming, melting and refreezing that can happen just literally where the rubber meets the road from braking action and oftentimes generally generating icy road conditions through that um, process as well, especially in high traffic volumes that may occur around uh, rush hour. So again, heavy snow bursts and flash freezes is what generates the most extreme impacts in many of the cases that we um, have examined uh, through the years. So what is a snow squall? Um, in a sentence, you can think of it as a mesoscale convective system producing gusty winds and heavy snow. I think as a meteorologist, that's probably the most useful way uh, to forecast these events. There are brief bursts of heavy snow accompanied by gusty winds and characterized by a rapid onset and near zero visibility. They generally do not reach our traditional snow advisory criteria. In fact, a casual recipient of a forecast may just hear there's a chance of snow showers today and that, that will be all they'll, they'll know. Falling temperatures again will produce a flash freeze situation on untreated roads and this can have deadly road consequences. So we see some time matched imagery here with the Fort Drum New York radar on the right and the Potsdam New York webcam on the left, just demonstrating the rapid onset and the near zero visibilities and uh, the quick cessation as well of conditions uh, with, with snow squalls. The snow squall duration is brief in the 36 events that uh, we examined uh, the heavy snow durations, the median length is only 17 minutes and the moderate snow only lasted about 26 minutes. Again, along an Arctic front, the, the line motion, you know, the motion is perpendicular to the long axis of the band. So the duration in any one location is actually quite short as opposed to a lake effect streamer where you may have uh, similar areas being, you know, affected repeatedly over many hours. Um, so a, a basic rule of thumb, if you expect the hazardous conditions to be less than an hour in duration, the snow squall warning uh, works quite well for that. If it's a multi-hour event, you really want to be leaning towards a WSW, either an advisory or a winter storm warning, depending on the uh, situation. Rather than show a case due to time, I'll just show the conceptual model that we came up with based on many cases. We have a, an Arctic front depicted here moving from left to right and an upper level trough in association with that and a 300 millibar jet streak. In all the cases we looked at, the snow squalls occurred on the cyclonic shear side or poleward of the um, 300 millibar jet axis. At the surface, you see a strong pressure rise fall couplet indicative of the uh, intense synoptic and mesoscale uh, forcings that are at play. In fact, the pressure rises will oftentimes be on the order of four to 10 millibars over three hours and you see the pressure falls out ahead of the front. In terms of instability, there is gonna be some. Uh, it's winter time, so your surface space capes are actually usually quite low between 50 and 100 joules per kilogram. You'll want to adjust your AWIP scales appropriately so you can see these very low values of cape that are important in these events. Uh, and then you see the frontogenetic circulation that's thermally direct. Uh, you have the upward branch where you generally get the 30 to 40 dBZ uh, max echoes and a 20 to 30 dBZ echo tops extending up to usually around 10,000 feet. I have seen cases up to about 15,000 feet um, for a max echo top. So they are convective features, but they're relatively shallow com compared to what we'd see in the warm season. On the descending branch of the frontogenetic max, you have a moist absolute unstable layer that helps to promote the downward mixing and the falling temperatures. And at 850 millibars, you'll typically see winds of 30 to 40 knots uh, perpendicular to the front on the backside as well. There is a snow squall parameter that we developed in association with our 2014 published work. Uh, just to mention briefly, that is baselined in AWIPS D2D in the volume browser. If you look under the winter menu, you'll be able to find it and display it for any model that you have. The SPC mesoanalysis also has it under their winter menu and the SIPs uh, from St. Lawrence, uh, sorry, St. Louis University, it's available for the GFS and NAM models under their winter menu. And then we run a local BTV four kilometer war for the Northeastern US uh, that also displays the snow squall parameter. So this can be a useful situational awareness tool. Uh, some work that uh, Dan Thompson and Greg Mann did uh, there's not a lot of radar guidance available, but they looked at a number of uh, highway pileup cases and determined that um, in the events that they looked at, the max DBZs were generally between 30 and 35 DBZ. 
and actually in terms of height was centered usually below about 5,000 feet AGL, again, going back to the shallow nature of these events. Um, as a rule of thumb, if you have a 30 dBZ line of snow squalls moving at at least 30 knots, you're generally gonna get relatively high impacts with that as long as the road temperatures aren't um, excess excessively warm. Um, 30 dBZ and 30 knot line motions generally get it done in terms of uh, needing an FQW. I also want to briefly mention uh, GO-16. Uh, we did develop a snow squall color table uh, with Dan Bikos out at CIRA. And uh, you can download this from VLAB for your office. It uh, highlights uh, convective cloud temperatures in the winter time that are useful for tracking snow squalls um, in the one minute data especially. One thing we find with the snow squalls is we get a lot of beam overshoot in between RDAs due to the shallow nature of these systems. So the satellite monitoring does become important, especially as you move uh, further away from uh, radar locations. And in addition to that, the webcams obviously in your area would be, would be useful. The future vision, again, uh, the WIA implementation should occur sometime this year once FEMA is done with the IPAWS testing of the 360 character implementation that Andy had mentioned. And in the future, we really want to get these warnings directly to the people that are most at risk, and that is the, the motorists out there. But at the same time, you don't want folks looking at their phones. So as you get the better integration via Bluetooth and the satellite-based Wi-Fis, there'll be more and more dashboard displays uh, showing warning information as folks approach the SQW polygons, um, noting, for example, icy roads and whiteout conditions ahead. We also have winter facets coming that will be probabilistic in nature and hopefully provide um, adjustable thresholds for where certain folks could uh, decide they want to be warned for uh, something like a snow squall. And the last point I want to mention is we'll eventually have autonomous vehicles someday as well. And that software is going to need to integrate when road conditions are rapidly changing up ahead. Uh, to reduce accidents there. So there's a lot in the next five to 10 years where these warnings are going to be used more and more and integrated more and more into the technology of uh, vehicles of different types. So with that, I will uh, conclude. Um, I'll take any questions now, and our emails are there as well if you have questions in the future. So uh, thanks again for the invite.